Hi, I'm Zach. That's how you get a hold of me. Um, for a long time, I, uh, I got started. I, I can tell the story that I was, I was nine years old, and my best friend got a Compact 64, and he wanted to figure out how to make games, and I wanted to figure out what you type at the keyboard to break it. And that kind of started my like wanting to break things with computers love uh, from being a kid. When I got to the Naval Academy um, at 22, I had to pick a career, and breaking computers wasn't a thing you could do yet in the Navy. So I did the Navy's Navy thing and went out and ran around on ships for, uh, for about 10 years. And then, um, uh, but I was always an electronic warfare and cyber geek at heart. Um, and then in 2007, there were a bunch of Americans getting killed in Iraq. Um, by radio, con radio control devices and electronic warfare fights. So I stuck my head in there and said, hey, that's kind of what I do. And so I went over and did electronic warfare in Iraq for a year and then went back and then went back and then went back and back and did electronic warfare and cyber for pretty much my last 12 years in the Navy. I spent my last four um, running cyber warfare research and development out of the Naval Postgraduate School and the Electrical Engineering Department there. And um, we had a great time. We have a, a resource of 26 PhDs, all cleared um, in computer science and electrical engineering. And we primarily took questions from folks around the Beltway or down in Tampa about, can you do this? And we're like, I don't know, we'll figure it out. And most of the time you can, because every computer is connected. And so there are a, a couple of just kind of ideas that, that shaped my thinking for the last um, four years that I want to tell you about. And, um, and then we'll, we'll branch from just kind of three or four basic concepts about the way I look at the um, interconnected digital environment we live in today and what you can do about it with containers, right? So whereas Aiden's talk was wonderful and included poetry and made me feel inadequate about my brief, um, we're going to come at it from a different angle. He talked from the bottom up about how you work on things that are important about certification. I'm going to work on it from the top down. The first is um, the enterprise engineering solutions for cybersecurity don't work. Um, firewalls, endpoint protection, configuration guidance works in a lab, right? And it works in a sales pitch, and it certifies you to PCI level two compliance so you can go to your insurance for your commercial entity and get insured because you have a cybersecurity and a cyber mitigation plan. But there's nothing, and this is really important for everybody in this room, this is the takeaway. There's nothing and no example at global scale where you can look at an organization that has worldwide deployment of computer infrastructure that hasn't been hacked, okay? And all of them are running top-end firewalls have paid Cisco and everybody else to build state-of-the-art cybersecurity systems for them, have hired the very best people that they can find to come work for them to work in their SOC, and they still get hacked. Um, the reason why, I mean, we can talk about this for a long time, but when I brought this up and I was talking to Betty about all the stuff we could bring up in this talk, she said, that's great, Zach. What I need you to do is talk about 20 minutes. So, so in order to, to meet that requirement, um, I'll just tell you, that the first generation of cybersecurity was written by engineers for engineers, right? So we had the computer science guys figuring out operations and sysadmins writing ops policies. And only until about maybe a year or two ago, the CIO wasn't really a C-suite dude, right? He had the C title, but he wasn't really responsible for line productivity of the organization. I think we've seen some, some levels of hacks in the past few years that have elevated that role in CISOs and CSOs, and now um, worldwide operations are directly attributable to the security of the enterprise, right? Ask Zuckerberg, who just got dragged right there, actually, right now. Um, if, if secured, like, he's right there, we're right here, right? Um, what's that? Reinvited, reinvited, right? Um, if, if security actually matters for the enterprise, and I think there's a changing paradigm about that, right? So the first thing is we got to do something different because everything else that, that we've got out there doesn't work. And the conga line of devices from IPS to IDS to spam filter to yada, yada, yada is a broken engineering solution. We need some new ideas. Containers, machine learning, and a couple other things start to get us close. The second thing, kind of big paradigm, I hope you walk out of this talk with, is that software is the building material of the 21st century. Um, it's, it's what we make stuff out of that makes a difference. So if, we, if I saw a colleague in here from the NIH, 
um, who is working on building uh, infrastructure that allows scientists to do important research, right? That is a cool project. I live out in Silicon Valley, and I joke about this all the time, but you know, there's engineers out in Silicon Valley working very, very hard to figure out how to build a drone that delivers deodorant, and we've got people in D.C. working on how to do cancer research on advanced development architectures, right? That's cool, and it matters. Um, and so the best things that are going to be invented in this century are going to be built out of software as a building material. So if you think of iron, aluminum, and silicon as the building materials of the last century, it was about 200 years from the Bessemer process was invented for how to make production grade steel till we came up with eddy current analysis and non-destructive penetrant dye testing to be able to test things made out of steel for the likelihood that they would fail before we used them. Okay, so where we're at in the idea of using software as a building material is we're about three or four decades into it, and we're just starting to figure out how to do pre-deployment testing of a thing built out of software in a way that we can see how it might fail in use. And, and I think we're going to, and so containers are another one of those things that allows us to implement a DevOps process. Why do we want to do that? What's the strategic level thing about building things out of software that makes that powerful? It's that... Finally, we have an architecture and a development model where we can actually do failure analysis on the thing that we just built before we put it into a mission critical situation. So it's good that we probably use software first to do really cool things like buy books on the internet. And as we move into actually building out how we provide uh, human services around the delivery of food and power and water, um, that we have three or four decades of practice about how to make sure they work before we build them. And the next thing is, um, we did a new strategic concept for cybersecurity. It's a little related to point A, but it's a little different, that um, it can't be about perimeter-based infrastructure protection. So everything we've done for the last 30 years about firewalls and, and, and securing the, the, the software in the middle of that firewall from the outside is a broken idea. And, and if 13% of people in government are using containers, about one thirteenth of 1% are actually thinking about how in the government are thinking about how to do security from the inside out. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. I just want to show some pictures before I start, though. The first is this, right? There will be an incident. Now, coincidentally, um, I ha got to have a really interesting conversation uh, with the... Um, uh, cybersecurity officer from Sony who didn't get fired after North Korea hacked them, right? A uh, $400 million loss for the company didn't get fired. And here's why. He had a graph that basically he'd given to his board about a week before, it was like two weeks before the, the big hack, that, that had his resourcing level and the types of adversaries he could expect to protect the company against given that resourcing level, right? He had nation state above threshold. So when North Korea hacked them, he's like, hey, you know, I told you about this. And he didn't get fired, right? But there will be an incident. Whether it's uh, Volkswagen who hacked the EPA, or it's Anthem who lost healthcare data, or it's Target who lost customer user data, or closer to home, if you're the director of the CIA and your personal email got hacked and you go give a press conference and you're like this, or my favorite, if you're Miss Archuleta and OPM gets hacked and you gave away every covert operator in the world's uh, personal data, that's what you do. You get called before Congress and you just touch your eyes like this. So this brief is, is how to keep everybody in this room who works in government from like having to do this face touch thing because you, you were surprised that there was an incident. Okay, there will be an incident. That's the reality of inside out security. It's like an Im immune system response. Somebody's gonna get the flu every year. It's not a question of whether or not somebody's gonna get the flu. It's as a public health program, what are we gonna do to keep everybody from getting the flu? So when there is an incident, how are you not going to leak data for seven months before you find out about it? So, and when that incident happens, um, you're going to have a continuity plan. You're going to have a response plan. You're required to. You wrote it down. Everybody's got one, right? Every continuity plan we have now for responses are mostly pretty slow, rarely practiced, because no one's going to let you take down the working infrastructure to actually practice the coop plan. You're going to do it like on a Saturday or a Sunday, kind of offline, and it's not really real because nobody's on the network. That's why we let you do the coop plan in the first place. Um, 
The other thing is, it's always different from baseline. So you've got the you've got this extra servers, or you've got the extra prim hardware in Tennessee on the different side of a fault line, depending on what each agency you're with, right? And but it's always different because we don't keep it up to date and we rarely practice. Here's some ways containers can help us get after what are we going to do when an incident really happens and help us start to implement that new security paradigm. The first thing is. And I'm not going to do all the hows and whys. There's lots of people in the room here who would be happy to tell you how and why. But you can restore on cloud or on, on premises or at a different premises, right? All because you've got that infrastructure scripted. You can practice it often. And finally, if your Docker files and your synchronization and management layers are the same in your coop plan as they are in your baseline plan, then you're actually practicing a legitimate restoration continuity program as opposed to something that we're doing now. The next big thing I want to talk about um, is, is a really hard to do in government, is all of you are here, and my guess is if you're, if you're from a government agency, you know, you said, hey, I'm going to a conference, and you got to go because it was in DC because you didn't have to put in DTS or some other travel system to get there, so, so you're able to come. And, and even then, you know, this is a one-day thing, so it's hard to do education. Um, most cybersecurity teams, whether they're the SOC or their tabletop-level exercises run with the C-suite um, or the directors of your agency, are very difficult to practice because they don't really reflect. It's kind of like in the military and the DOD, like we never practice space, right? We never actually turn the satellites off. We just kind of simulate all that. We do the same thing for cybersecurity plans a lot. Um, so I wanted to tell you about it. It's a free, it's a government resource. We built it a couple years ago at the Naval Postgraduate School. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Naval Postgraduate School, it's DOD's only. Um, uh, graduate school that we run. It's not like the War College. It's actually, you know, it, it's technical. It's technical degrees. The Navy founded it 100 years ago because this whole um, putting electricity on ships that are exposed to seawater seemed like a way to kill people. So we decided to stand up an electrical engineering program and actually figure out how to actually uh, put DC on ships without electrocuting everybody. And we just kept rolling with it because it was working for us. Um, so we built a program around lab tainers. You can Google MPS lab tainers and find it. Um, free resource. The important thing about lab tainers is you, you walk you through spinning up containers and actually running cybersecurity exercises. So in a lab tainer, you can actually teach people the basics of cybersecurity because they're actually watching uh, malware move from one uh, computer running in the one container to the other, right? So you can actually bring up environments so people go, oh, that's what the denial of service looks like. Wow, that's bad. And have some like intuitive uh, understanding of what's going on there. Um, larger, more complex scenarios are entirely possible and plausible. I would encourage everybody as they look at, in one of these tabletop exercises with the actual leadership of your agency or a project, to say, what are we going to do when this thing gets hacked? Right. Because as we continue to build things out of software, um, there, are, there are structural defects and things built out of software that we don't have good tools to find. We talked about that already. There are other people that are working very, very hard to find them. So everything that I ever built for the DOD or some of the intelligence agencies that I work for around here, I had a unique perspective of always thinking to myself, the very smartest people in China or Russia are actively trying to break this. That's an interesting paradigm to bring to a project. When you know for a fact that some of the smartest people in the world, are their day job and they're getting paid to do it, are, is to try and break your stuff, it actually kind of puts a new paradigm uh, around what it is that you're doing. So if you think like that, then you've got to get to larger, more complex scenarios where you say, hey, let's find a way to replicate this application that we just wrote and see how resilient it is, see how good we are at actually changing the networking. Containers provide a wonderful environment to be able to spool that game up, learn, go back, and actually run a tabletop exercise with uh, supported IT, right? That's the problem we have in wargaming right now is that we've, we, have a, we have a hard time going from the, the scripted discussion phase 
to the, oh, how would that actually look in infrastructure phase, right? And so containers are a really powerful way to do that. And then if you want to get um, even more sophisticated, there are cyber ranges that are operated by lots of customers around the Department of Defense you can reach out to. But from a, from a strategic leadership perspective, and I think you get to come to a conference like this because you're a decision maker in the organization, right? You're bringing new ideas. The new idea you need to bring is that we need to get people's hands on the keyboards to educate them. Um, DEF CON is popular for two reasons. One, it's in Vegas, and, and geeks take over Vegas for a week, right? And that's kind of cool. And then the other thing is it's actually centered around actually letting people try it out. And so in order to make IT tangible, in order to make security tangible, you got to let people get their hands on it. Don't let them touch the production system. Spool it up in containers. And I think the third thing I wanted to get through is still workforce education. No. When I used to have my students do their PhD dissertation defenses, and it took three of them to turn on the projector. I always found some irony that it takes three electrical engineering PhDs to get a projector to work. Um, that we've said this a lot, right? We've said this a lot, but it comes back, I think, to what Aiden was talking about a minute ago, is that the reason why there's such low adoption of modern IT practices in the government is because the certification process is just so dang hard. Right? Um, I have a big question mark on bullet one there. DevOps enabled by RMF? Most people kind of think of it as the other way around. Like, I can't do DevOps because of RMF. Right? Um, I want to I wanna encourage everybody here to start flipping the script on that. Get back and start thinking about the fact that having my infrastructure written as code in my Docker file and in my management layer actually gives me a way to articulate very succinctly where my continuous monitoring is. And if, we go, if you go into RMF and we geek out on this, right, you can get down there and read where you can do continuous code deployment in accordance with RMF as long as you have a continuous monitoring and integration phase. And you're able to articulate that with some of the specific tools that Aiden talked about before, particularly the ones provided by the Enterprise Edition, where they say, hey, AC1, here's how we meet it. And get to where you're at a, you're at a cut and paste for your RMF plan. Um, the fact that the Docker file established the exact configuration for your, your working infrastructure, that cannot be like, you know, that's, that's the overstomped important point here. The biggest thing, I think from, from, the, from the technician's perspective, everybody gets why that's cool. What's missing, I think, in our discussions with leadership is when you run a federal program or you run a DOD program, you have lots of sites where you have to go install code. And even if you're not actually pulling down that code out of a registry and launching the Docker file locally, the problem we have right now is that you, you hire a contractor to build something. One contractor is actually building it. They have a subcontractor that's actually doing the technical documentation of how to install it and load it. So then you actually get the delivery of the thing. You get, it, you get it installed and demoed in your headquarters here around the Beltway somewhere. And then you say, OK, go to Idaho and put it out, put it out in Idaho. And you, you ship it out there, and you send it to your sysadmin out there, and he tries to load it up, and it doesn't work. right? And then you're like, I don't know what the problem is. And then you have to send your SME out there with him, and he does it. We've all experienced this. In my world in the Navy, it was usually going to you know, Bahrain or Singapore or Japan or someplace else because you had to have the one dude get out there to fix it. This cannot be overstated in a global organization that the, the Docker file actually having all the build steps so that it runs is so important because you're taking that one person's knowledge and, and scripting it out so that if, it, if that container runs in DC, it'll run in Guam. Um, and, that, and even if you're not pulling out a registry and he's taking that Docker file with him on a CD or a thumb drive, thumb drive horrible word to say in the government, but uh, taking, that doc, taking the Docker file on a CD or a thumb drive, it's going to work when they get to wherever it is they get off the plane. Um, and so you don't need all the DevOps stuff because you've, you've encapsulated that subject matter expertise is ideas. And I think I would love to have some questions because there's so many things that I could talk about. I'd rather talk about the stuff that is on y'all's minds. So somebody, somebody asked me a really hard one. Hit me. Yeah. An admiral once asked me this, he goes, don't, tell me, don't talk to me about servers, don't talk about network, how are you going to help me with my mission? 
Right. And I've spent a lot of time today listening, and not one person started with mission. So how is how is this going to help? I feel bad now. I usually start with mission. Now yeah, I feel how, bad. I thought I let does, you down. How does you know how does DoD deliver mission? Yeah. This, could look, this looks like another technical tool uh, looking for a problem. Right. Okay. So so everybody heard it. He said. What about mission? If I talk to an admiral who says, hey, how are you going to help me with my mission, not tell me how you're going to do my back-end orchestration. The first thing I say, I, I, I tell them, is that, um, is that uh, software is mission. So, so the number one cost driver in Joint Strike Fighter, everybody knows, is code. The thing, the thing a lot of people don't know is, again, right out there, when the Nunn McCurdy panel reviews program overrun, the number one cause of a major program getting none mccurdy is failure to do proper cost estimation on software. Um, the last thing I would say to folks is uh, the only weapon system left in the, almost the entire Department of Defense, but certainly in the Navy, where, where, where a human being actually fires it as a 50 cal machine gun. Everything else, you push a button and the computer does the shooting. So software is mission. And so what we're, we're, we're talking about is how do I increase the reliability of mission because I develop it in a way that is, that is taking advantage of best practices, right? The, the second answer I would say to that is the, the biggest problem we have right now with the federal acquisition regulations is that they were written to optimize the business practices for building things out of metal. So, so a friend of mine, a Naval Academy classmate of mine, um, is the chief of security for Apple, and not, uh, not cybersecurity. He's, he does OPSEC. So his job for Apple is to make sure that when Tim Cook gets on stage, at a room much like this one, but bigger with thousands more people, um, and announces a new product, everybody's surprised. And he has the hardest OPSEC job, I think, in the world, because everybody wants to know what the next iPhone is going to look like. Only the Chinese and Russians are really trying to figure out what we're doing next. So. So, and so, you know, we were at a Halloween party last time, and I asked him, I'm like, you know, I'm like, promise me that there's like a, a seven to 10 year hardware development cycle for what's going into iWatch and iPhone, right? And that, that it's not magically done in two years. And that's the case, right? So what we wrote into the FAR are industrial, uh, industrial age best practices over delivering um, advanced hardware over about a seven to 10 year delivery cycle. Now the fact that F-35 is 24 years in, in the Navy context, um, 24 years ago is when we first released the contract for, for Joint Strike Fighter and it doesn't go on its first deployment until 2021. That's too long for hardware. But the thing that, it, but DevOps is allowed in the FAR, it's just not in most SOPs, right? And so what we need to tell people is that there needs to be an industrial timeline for how you develop the military hardware that you use, but it needs to be disconnected from the development of the software that runs on it so that we can get to the point where we're hardware agnostic. So when you're talking to an ad about mission, what, you know, the example I use is that on day one of a war with China, there are going to be all sorts of signals come up into the, in, into the electromagnetic spectrum we've never seen before. Right? And if we have a 10-year adaptation to those, then we lost. Or when they find a, a bug in the Virginia class submarine, the F-18, or the Arleigh Burke destroyer, the three of our primary weapon systems, when they find a bug in it, and they will, what will it be? Do we have a DevOps process in place to fix that in about 10 days? Or is it about a 10-month turnaround? One of those we win, one of those we lose. And so that's how I, I talk about missions. Thanks, that's a cool question. Anybody else? Everybody else has got this, yeah. Yeah, I used to write the FAR. Nice. <laughs> it's his fault. He used to write the FAR. That's all you need to know. I, I take ownership. Any suggestions, to amendments to the FAR to get specific in this area of software development? I do. So, so the question was, do I have any recommended suggestions or amendments to the FAR? And in the interest of keeping this in a two-minute answer, <laughs> no, um, I think what would be helpful in the FAR is not necessarily in the specific guidance of the bullet by bullet of how, how programs are executed, but, but in strategic guidance that, sa that, that says that, um, for example, like engineering demonstration models. 
um, and some of the other elements of major, major ACAT acquisition can be done by ra through rapid prototyping procedures. Um, because right now, people don't think about using the EDM capability um, in order to create rapid prototypes to iterate on requirements. And the other thing is, we need to build it and test it and then write the requirement. Right now, we're trying to specify an end state, and the FAR, the FAR leans you toward writing a full set of requirements for what has to come at the end of a two-year acquisition cycle, as opposed to saying, uh, identifying the problem that you want solved and allowing you to do iterative development in a DevOps model along the way. Cool, that's a great question. Again, he wrote the FAR, yellow tie, gray jacket. Anybody else? Uh, thank you so much. I'll be around, and uh, hopefully we can answer.